Uh, good morning. This is February 9th, um, and uh, this is the first day uh, post our uh, traditional town meeting recess, and this is the Vermont House Human Services Committee, and we are uh, today going to um, finish for and uh, our work um, marking up, uh, oh, it's March 9th, sorry. Um, we are, we are going to finish marking up H-171, um, the bill around child care. Uh, over town, when, if people have been following this um, on the Friday before town meeting recess, just as we um, uh, were adjourning, a, a small group of uh, committee members, um, Representative Brumstead, Representative Small, Representative... Whitman um, and uh, I believe Amy Schulenberger um, and um, uh, Morgan, um, from Amy Schulenberger from After School um, Vermont and Morgan uh, Crossman from Building Bright Futures. And I don't know, um, Sarah Kenny, if um, Let's Grow Kids, that you were not involved in this part, but this small group worked on um, re um, taking our feedback and rewriting the um, or redrafting, making some more changes in these studies. Um, and that is the major part of work that was done um, over the break, um, not counting the work that uh, Joint Fiscal did in terms of presenting um, a fiscal note. Uh, a, the draft um, version five uh, went out um, Thursday or Friday, uh, the committee all got the draft on Monday or Tuesday. Um, thank you, Representative McFawn. Um, I, you indicated that you had gotten it. Um, and uh, the uh, interested parties got the draft on Thursday or Friday and have had um, those days to um, look at it. So that I believe is where we are right now. Katie. Good morning. Good morning. So I will pull up my document. Let's see if I remember how to do this after a recess. There we go. Are you looking at section nine? Yes, we are. Okay, and I thought I would just address, I know the document that was circulated to members last week and um, other folks was draft 5.1. And we're looking at draft 5.3 today. There were not any major changes, um, but JFO pointed out a few um, minor corrections that needed to happen. So that's why the number has changed. But um, with regard to the sections we're going to be looking at, there are no significant substantive um, changes that were made between 5.1 and 5.3. So um, maybe I'll just step back for a minute because it's been a little, a couple days since we've looked at this um, to remind you what the last sections of the bill are. So first in section nine, we have the advisory committee. This is an existing committee that will have um, altered membership to provide advice to um, both the child development division, um, the agency of human services, and it lists all different items that the committee is to provide advice on. There's also um, in section 10, I'll, I'll go back and look at this in more detail, but in section 10, um, there are, um, there's the systems analysis study. In section 11, we have what we were calling the, the mini study. Um, this is a report on two different items, the attendance base model, and also um, reaching um, the, the co-payment, so families are not paying more than 10% of their gross annual income on childcare. And then the last piece that I think we're looking at this morning is the financing study, section 12. So those are the four pieces that are kind of in play here. And I'll scroll back up to section nine. Um, so as we were leaving um, on Friday afternoon, the conversation uh, had a lot to do with what age group are each of these pieces focused on? Are we looking at um, children and families zero through age five? Are we looking uh, broader at um, families with children zero through age 12? 
And so one of the things that the small group was discussing on Friday afternoon was um, the age range that applied to each of these pieces. So you'll see with regard to this first piece, the advisory committee piece, um, we have a definition at the very end of this section. I'll um, come back to that highlighted piece. Um, but there's a definition section here. What do we mean by childcare and early childhood education in this particular section? And here we're saying that it has to do with children. Oh, I can't highlight. Um, children from birth through 12 years of age. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but that's on um, lines 11 and 12. So with regard to this section, we're referring to a, a broader swath of families birth through um, children 12 years of age. And I'm gonna scroll back up to point out to you this highlighted language in yellow. Um, this has to do with the report that is coming. There are two annual reports that are coming to the relevant committees. And this new yellow language specifies that all the findings and recommendations provided under this subdivision are to be divided into two parts. Um, first birth through age five years of age, and then six through 12 years of age. So it makes a distinction of how the, the data will be presented in these re reports broken down, broken out by age. So that's the advisory committee. I'm gonna keep scrolling down to section 10. And this is the systems analysis. Um, and again, the conversation here was what age are we looking at? I have systems um, highlighted throughout because um, as we were leaving, this was called the governance study and we, we changed it to systems. So I just highlighted everywhere where that change was made. Um, again, you'll see this language with regard to the analysis and recommendations that's being um, submitted pursuant to this section on systems. It's the same language that the findings and recommendations are, are divided in the manner that they're presented, um, birth through age five and then six through 12 years of age. And then again, we have a definition section um, that is specific to this section 10, and it is the same as the previous section, and that when we say child care and early childhood education, we, we are um, referring broadly to children birth through 12 years of age. The next section is section 11, and I don't believe we made any changes in this section since the last time the committee looked at it. So I'll scroll past that. That was the, the mini study for, for lack of a better um, phrase for it. And then we have section 12, which was the financing study. Um, and so here is where there was a lot of conversation about who, who are we referring to when we're talking about um, child care and early education. So the small group decided to handle this by removing the definition of child care and early education altogether that you've seen in the previous sections that we just reviewed. And instead, in the introductory language in this first subsection A, specifying that we're looking um, at Vermont's existing child care system for children from birth through 12 years of age. So in the introductory language, we're setting up that we're kind of taking a big picture view. We're looking at zero through age 12. But then we go on to list the following goals that this financing um, um, report is going to be looking at. And one of those goals, we're specifying that we only want data from birth through five years of age. So even though the big picture for everything else is birth through 12 years of age, as set up in this introductory language, when it comes to a family not spending more than 10% of its gross annual income on childcare, it's for children from birth through five years of age. So we're kind of creating a carve out from the general rule that you've set up in subsection A. And then that language is mirrored further down. Um, so we're in subsection C, um, we're talking about what is in the consultant's evaluation. The committee chose to add language that um, this would take into consideration um, the work of the Blue Ribbon Commission um, and also the report issued by the Universal After School Task Force um, in doing this work. So that's new language. And then, here it is. Um, so you have language in subdivision two on page 20 that the consultant is to submit a report 
And it goes on to detail what is in the results of that report. And again, with regard to um, identifying and determining the feasibility of implementing a stable long-term funding source for affordable high quality um, early child care system, we're doing it, um, we're adding another kind of carve out from the rule of zero to 12. And we're saying that this is specifically applies for birth through five years of age, given the um, child care's role in post pandemic stimulus and economic development. So let me just restate. So in subsection A, at the very beginning of this entire section, we're kind of setting out as a general rule, the financing study is looking in all aspects at um, families with children zero through age 12, except for when we have a specific carve out with regard to certain areas. And those are the carve outs that I pointed out. And those apply to only families with children birth through five years of age. And then um, you'll notice that I, I don't have the strike through, but there had been a definition section here. And that definition section has since been removed to reflect the other changes. So that's it for those four sections. Why don't I stop the share? There we go. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. I am wondering, um, <clears throat> uh, Representative Rumstead, if you or someone in your in the group that you were part of can refresh our memory because you were the group um, um, or read, you know made some suggestions to the um, all of the reports uh, building bright the report related to building bright futures as well as the financing report. And the financing report that came in the bill as introduced was very specific around um, modalities used and how to do the assessment and those kinds of things. And those were taken out. So um, uh, to refresh our memory um, <clears throat> around those two sections while the uh, <clears throat> change that happened between 10 days ago and now, um, 10 days ago, Friday, and now really had to do with um, how we balance uh, the fact that after school is part and parcel of the childcare um, system. Um, Jessica, uh, Representative Brum said, I see that you're, <clears throat> you are no longer, um, that, you, that you're ready to speak. Oh, <laughs> I unmuted, yes. I, um, I believe that we did that because we didn't want to narrow what, we didn't want to say to the organizations that would be conducting both joint fiscal and building bright futures um, by naming the specific ways that they could do the research study, we would be narrowing what they, there might be other um, opportunities and so we, took it out. But honestly, I don't remember us having a long conversation about that as a small subcommittee. I just remember us talking about it in the big committee. So if anyone in our little committee could remind me, I'm wondering, honestly, if Morgan might have um, something to add to that as someone who was going to be working on one of these studies and pulling this together. Sure. Um, for the record, Dr. Morgan Crossman, Executive Director of Building Bright Futures, and I apologize, there's so much uh, work happening in my office, so you're going to hear a lot going on in the background. Um, you know, one of the things that I would mention specific to the, the committee, the advisory committee, is that we did include language uh, in the membership, membership section, so I believe in draft 5.1 on page 12, lines five through nine, we tried to provide some flexibility in study membership. And as I mentioned to this committee, uh, this is an existing committee that is part of a series of committees that advise the governor, the legislature, the administration on a range of different topic areas. This one is specifically the Early Learning and Development Committee, but we do have six other committees that support broader efforts in this air, in this arena, right? So we have a families and communities committee, we have a professional preparation and development committee. Both of those groups have a series, uh, sorry, we also have a child outcomes accountability team. Those groups also 
address some childcare related uh, barriers, challenges, and concerns. So what we tried to do in this section is include broader language to say at the very end lines eight and nine, that the membership of this committee shall engage the following members. And there's a series one through 21 <laughs> Um, of folks that would be engaged in this work. It doesn't necessarily mean that every single com other committee will be brought into this committee, but that we'll work to make sure that we are engaging those other committees and all of the groups represented here um, to make sure that we have consistency and alignment across some of our work there. Um, with respect to the addition on page 14, lines six through nine, where there's a section saying all findings and recommendations will be divided by these subsections. That is completely acceptable based on our work. Our work is broad in terms of the early childhood spectrum. We actually operate prenatal and in some cases through age 12, it makes complete sense for us to have that breakdown of zero to five and six to age 12. And we're happy to do that in all of the different sections of our work. Thanks. Thank can, I wonder maybe Nolan could help then on the, this question of why we took out all of the, um, I'm just looking for the actual language that's not there <laughs> in some of my older versions. Clarification, Madam Chair, are we, were you asking about section 12 and uh, the resources or tools that were expected um, that the uh, committee would use? Because I think that was removed from the uh, larger committee discussion, we really focused on the language of zero to 12 um, okay. and a smaller group discussion following uh, Friday's committee. Okay, um, thank you for that clarification, Representative Small. I was, um, uh, I, I was asking about the, um, the broader discussion um, and partly to set the stage for um, to bring us back as to why we did that so that when we hear from um, Let's Grow Kids and sort of their suggestion and wanting to put it back in, um, uh, why we did what we did. Um, and I, um, I am remembering um, uh, Representative Rosenquist. I see your hand up. I need to break into that. I just wanted to make a comment on this section here. Because okay, I, go ahead. I, go I ahead. brought up uh, before that I thought we should include the Associated Industries of Vermont as far as one of the businesses because they represent uh, a broader spectrum of businesses, not, not necessarily the larger businesses like the Business Roundtable, but they represent a key sector of our smaller businesses in the state of Vermont. So I, I believe they should be uh, included in this group. Thank you, Representative Rosenquist. Representative Wood. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I was recalling the same thing that Representative Small did and, and Representative Brumstead in terms of the, our broader discussion, uh, not wanting to <laughs> limit um, the, the people who may um, bid on these studies. Um, but my question was, I'm still struggling a little bit with section 12 um, and trying to understand the birth through 12 years of age. So we have that broad you know, introductory paragraph that uh, Katie spoke to, um, and then we narrow it down. So any of the financial reports deal with, it, it seems like it's, it seems, Odd to me um, that we, we go from this broad and but yet then we only want information in, for this carve out of children birth through five years of age in the financial. I realize the other studies include both age groups, but in the financial part, it seems like we're only asking for birth through five years of age on the financial side of things. And any changes we make in birth through five will impact after school. So. I am having um, a hard time understanding why we aren't asking for the birth through five and the six through 12 um, in terms of financial implications, because you can't, it's kind of like, you know, if we push in here, it is going to pop out here. So I, I'm not sure how we can ask for one without understanding the implications for the other. Excellent question. Um, 
Representative Wood and Amy Sholen Berger might help, may be able to help. This was one of the pieces that we all struggled with for a while after our meeting, like how to um, limit how broad the study is, but yet also get all the information that's necessary in order to make sure the after school crowd felt that we were doing, we were uh, pulling the right information. Can you help Amy a little bit on how we came down to this? Is that okay, Madam Chair? Absolutely. We're having, we're, we're in the committee room and we're having a discussion. Uh, okay, for the record, Amy Schollenberger, and I'm here representing Vermont After School today. And again, Holly Morehouse sends her regrets. She's uh, at the summer task, task force meeting with the governor's staff. So a lot going on in this area. Um, so first of all, I wanna say, I'm not 100% sure this is the right answer. Um, we all did our best to try to sort this out. So I'm going to leave it to the committee's wisdom. But the idea that I was trying to get across was I know that originally this study was meant to look at the early childhood, the whole system, <laughs> not just CCFAP. And the after school task force, Universal After School Task Force, which Rep. Paula is co chairing, is looking at the whole after school system um, also. And so I thought that rather than duplicating what the Universal After School Task Force is doing, um, that this study maybe could focus on just zero to five for the financing. And if I understand the language right, this is not only CCFAP financing, but the, the whole system, which that's why my suggestion was to limit it to birth to five just for that particular area. But again, if I misunderstood that, or if the committee, obviously if the committee disagrees, that that's up to you all. Um, that helps me in terms of understanding maybe what the intent was. And I see Representative Payal has got her hand up, um, but I, I think that if that's what the intent is, because it, it seems like it's an, um, it, it, when, when reading this, it feels like there's an omission. And so if that is the intent, then maybe we need to put something in here about the after school study or something, you know, that this would be combined with the, and I know that said earlier in earlier parts of the, of the bill, but maybe around this financing piece, we also need to reference that if um, the, the group that Representative Paella is chairing is um, going to deal with financing as well. We have, Just, yeah, sorry, well, sorry, yeah. No, I was going to say, we have lots of hands up um, and um, for the discussion. And just what I am under, <clears throat> when we began this journey several weeks ago, we were focused on zero to five. And we were focused on um, what was and what is our um, long, what is our North Star or no, our North Star being um, that no Vermonter with children would pay more than 10% of their income on childcare. We weren't ready to go there completely until we have a study, a financial study. And that that's, that's when we, some of what representative Wood and um, the after school program and others and Representative Wood brought brought up or identified that you know that childcare you know it, this will have ripple effects potentially so that's that's what I believe where we sort of are right now um, Representative um, Ayella Small and McFawn uh, I just wanted to echo that what Amy had said about um, the fact that we were recognizing that the long-term financing study originally was talking zero to five and that there's a separate discussion going on around long-term financing um, for after school um, and that we, we didn't want to duplicate efforts, but I like Teresa's thought that having another um, 
clarifying sentence or something, um, making that a little bit more clear is a good idea because we, I think that the, the overlap of the two is really CCFAP, but because that's only what 20% of the people utilizing the overall mm -hmm. system, um, that isn't the, the solution to um, the whole problem for, for both or for all age groups. So, um, and, and I think that the after school task force doesn't, doesn't want to be in competition with zero to five in terms of whatever the long-term um, financing mechanisms are. So I just wanted to toss that in. It's Thank likely you. to be di likely to be different <laughs> sources of revenue to to go to each system. Okay. Thank you. Representative Small and then Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Three quick things, I promise. Um, the first is agreeing with Representative Wood and including that language so that it doesn't seem like we are leaving out uh, youth the six to twelve. The second is clarifying for Representative Rosenquist that we have uh, three representatives from the business community in the Building Bright Futures uh, larger group. And it's from the Vermont Business Roundtable, Vermont Business for uh, Social Responsibility, and then the National Federation of Independent Businesses. I didn't necessarily catch the exact one that you were hoping for, but wondering if it was one of those three. And then the last is adding in, I think it would be great to hear testimony again from Nolan on the piece as to why we removed those tools in the first place from uh, the financing study. And those are my pieces. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Small. I think the, um, and thank you for pointing out who is um, um, on, who has been identified as members of the um, group. Um, we went to, organizations as opposed to, um, for lack of a better term, industry specific, um, because each of those organizations, one has, has on some level a different political um, bent, if one might say. So we have, um, <clears throat> and each has as their members, a diversity of industries. Um, and so um, that may not be uh, what you are looking for, Representative Rosenquist. That is, I believe, the, um, imp the impetus for how that um, was. And there were, if you recall, there were no business members um, in, <clears throat> on this committee in the bill as introduced. And it was um, at the request of um, the business groups that we added them and there that you know that there, there was a choice i mean there was a choice in terms of doing it by size or doing it by industry or doing it by organizations that will um that represent a diversity and so that um we certainly can revisit that if you like representative rosenquist later but that oh, is where I, we i i understand and i had forgotten uh, representative small pointed out that representative of the National Federation of Independent Businesses, and I'd forgotten that they were on this list, and they probably would satisfy the concern I had about some smaller businesses being represented. So okay. thank you, Representative Small. Well, thank you. Um, Representative McFawn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to put my two cents in on the language. Um, if we're gonna get a comprehensive financial report, I think we have to include the six through 12. That's number one. Number two, um, I, I don't know what authority, by what authority the after school group is doing their study. Um, I don't want to see things going at cross purposes, um, but we're going to engage a consultant to do this, to do all of this. And that consultant is going to use certain tools 
to come up and, and they're going to be involved with certain identities gathering this information for us. If we've got somebody else taking, you know, approximately half of uh, the people that may be in um, these daycare centers or these child care centers, um, searching out this information with a different tool altogether, I I'm just wondering whether or not that would run, you'd be running at cross purposes. <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying, you got two groups studying um, the day, 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 uh, the uh, child care program, different age groups. One affects the other, there's no question about it, because daycare A, if they have zero to six, and then people coming in after school, uh, you're studying that particular uh, business, you're gonna, you, you, you understand what I'm saying? You're getting facts from different places and uh, using a different tool. So I, I would rather see the consultant do the whole thing. Um, I think then you get, you get that, uh, if, if they wanna coordinate uh, with somebody that's looking into it, I don't know if there's an official thing that the after school program is doing a lot. Um, so um, Representative McVaughn, I'm going to put Representative Paella on the spot. Uh, <clears throat> And if she needs consultation from the after school <laughs> group um, or, or let, um, joint fiscal, but she is the co chair of the after school something group. <laughs> um, and that she's going to be better than I am at um, pinpointing the um, where in statute or in the white books there was the. Um, authority to do to have this group uh so i've set the stage for you <laughs> sort Thank of you, chair. <laughs> so I, i'll actually uh point to page 19 line 9 um to point out where under what authority the after school task force is um operating and uh it the task force was set up in the the budget bill at the end of last year. And so um, we're, what the task force is doing is, it is in parallel actually to this, it's kind of looking at what the long-term goal is of providing universal after school um, statewide is um, both by increasing access and um, creating a more equitable programming everywhere. I mean, the, they're much like childcare, there are gaps in parts of the state where after school isn't offered at all. And then there are programs that, um, you know, ha have challenges with the number of people they can serve and the types of people that they're um, able to serve and their transportation issues, just like in um, the childcare sector. So, you know, it's dealing with that other age group of kids, but it is essentially doing the same thing. I think that um, what we are trying to do is is lay out a road roadmap for what um, the system for after school can look like to to have it be a, a a more universal program, and looking at all of the different funding sources that go into after school um, because there are several uh, and programs often use braided funding streams. So, but there's still not enough money, right? Like in all things, there's not enough money. So um, we're trying to, in parallel with this, we're looking at what a, a long-term steady funding stream could be to, to increase access everywhere. And at the moment, the, the stream that the after school task force is looking at is the um, cannabis money that would be hopefully continuing to go to the prevention fund um, and that prevention dollars would be used to help fund after school. Um, but of course that's several years out. So there's 
you know, what we're able to do now in anticipation of um, a, a long-term funding stream coming online in the future. So I, I don't, does that answer all of your questions, Representative McFawn? Uh, no, um, I, I appreciate that explanation. Um, uh, my, my question, the question that comes up to me is there are certain dates that um, the uh, Universal After School Task Force, what, do they have certain dates that they have to meet to provide certain information? On, uh, are they um, mm -hmm. commensurate with the dates that this consultant has to provide certain information? Because if the consultant is going along and let's say on November 1st, they have to come up with uh, some information for us. And the after school task force is going along and um, their date to come up with the information is um, January. That means that consultant doesn't have that uh, information. Right, so the, the short answer to that is yes, the timeline is fine. We've been meeting since um, right before session started. Our last meeting is going to be on the 29th and the report that we are working on is due on April 15th. So all of the work that we are- Of what are, year? Of what this year? This year, this year. Okay, so, so you're so, gonna have that information by April 15th, which um, this consultant probably won't even have started by then. Correct. So all of the information that we are working on will be finalized and available for the consultant to, to use um, in the study. And the, uh, the, it is the report that is due on April 15th is mentioned, again, on page 19, um, lines 8 and 9. So that will be available to be used in this study so that it's not a duplication of effort, efforts or. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to. Um, okay, I don't the, see uh, that. Um, um, Topper, uh, excuse me, Representative McVaughn, yeah. the um, uh, DCF financial director, Sarah Truckle, has um, been waiting patiently in the wings with her hand up and um, given the fact that she's the finance director, I'm thinking that she has something to add to this conversation. So before we get, I can, I'd like to have her insert um, her comments and then we can go back. So to Madam Chair, you're asking, me, you're asking me to relinquish my I time. Am. I, I am. I will reserve some time though, after uh, she speaks. I, I'm sure you will. Thank you, Representative McVaughn. Um, Sarah, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sarah Truckle, DCF Finance Director, for the record. Um, I thought it was important to bring up that in the governor's three-year plan, um, so this year in our FY22 budget, we are actually moving to that family copay uh, in the CCFAP program, which means that we are including uh, after school and school-age children, age six through 12, in that family copay who are attending regulated care. Um, in our fact sheet, as you may recall, we did have some examples of families who are currently using um, the birth through five system for their younger children, but are not accessing after school care for their older children. And that now that family copay would mean that they're not gonna pay any more to access that care. Um, so I just think that that's a really important part of where we're moving and that in addition to that from a data and payment methodology and as we're de uh, designing this first module of the new BFIS system, we are basing that off of the methodology of this family copay, which would be inclusive of those uh, school age children in the regulated system of care. Um, and I don't know if Melissa would add any more of the programmatic elements, but from a financial end, it, it is that family copay that we've shifted to in, in year three. Thank you, Sarah. Melissa, did you want to add something to what uh, the finance director was saying? Um, I, I think the only thing I would add is that uh, the after school world uh, encompasses many different uh, program types. Um, and the CCFAP program, our purview really is regulated after school programs. 
So um, the report that's coming in April is looking at financing a, a full system of after school. Um, and CCFAP is included in that analysis. But if we're going to be studying uh, a universal system using a CCFAP mechanism, um, that does include uh, children of families that are choosing our regulated system. Um, and it would, it would be a bit of a false, I think, um, separation if we don't include after school in that financing study. Thank you. Um, Representative Wood and um, uh, committee, <clears throat> I just wanna say we have 15 minutes before we go on the floor. Um, and Representative Wood has her hand up um, uh, and Representative McFawn and yeah. So I wanna say we have um, uh, 10 minutes um, before we need to break to go on the floor. Um, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be brief. I, I think that with the addition uh, on, on page 18, if there was another uh, thing that followed after paragraph number one on, on line 13 that deals with birth through five, if we right underneath that put the reference to the after school study that will uh, inform this financial um, study that we're looking at. Um, I, it feels to me like that would satisfy my um, it, my concern as well as uh, hopefully Representative McFawn's concern about looking at the the whole system from birth to age twelve. Okay. Um, I yes, go ahead. Madam Chair, yes. Yeah, um, I, I'm okay with that. I just have one more question. Um, what we just heard. Uh, from the finance director, does that include uh, the piece where we're going from up to, up to 350% of the poverty level? Yes, it does. It does. Then, Madam Chair, um, thank you very much for having me back on. I agree with Representative Wood, um, and I'm completely satisfied. Oh, thank you, Representative McFawn. Appreciate that. Um, um, at the risk of, I'm not quite sure what. Um, no, to be perfect, I'm really not quite sure where we are um, uh, in terms of the studies. Uh, joint fiscal, uh, Joyce Manchester, you're, you're, you have your hand up to, re to um, rescue me. Thank you. I do, thank you. For the record, Joyce Manchester from the Joint Fiscal Office. So I wanted to raise some parallels between what this study looks like to me and the higher education uh, study of, of uh, the Vermont State College system and so forth. So at the time that we put together the uh, RFP for that study, we knew that there were other groups that were working on some of the very same problems. So there was a board of trustees effort underway. There was a uh, Advance Vermont or, or some such name that was working on it. There was uh, another group of union folks that were working on the, the problem. And so uh, what we said in the RFP is that the consultant would would work with or would recognize these other groups and, and, and basically not step on their toes, right? But take into account their, their uh, findings and so forth. And it seems to me you would do the same thing in, in this study. You would say, yes, the consultant should um, recognize the findings of this after school task force um, and uh, you know, work along those guidelines but certainly you want the consultant to be able to think on its own, on his or her own, uh, in terms of the best methods of, of financing. If you think about the entire zero to five and six to 12 system together, right? There may be a way to, to put those financing sources together. I, I, I don't know, but you don't wanna preclude that necessarily. So it seems to me that, that adding some sentence uh, right up front that says, Yes, the primary emphasis may be on zero to five, but we want to include the the, uh, the financing and the impacts and so forth of the six to 12 um, 
after care after school system would make a lot of sense. Um, thank you. Um, would that change? I will direct this, uh, Joyce, both to you and or Nolan. Um, there is right now a figure that we have for what the what we are what we are suggesting is the needed appropriation to do the study. Um, does that change that needed appropriation? I don't know if no one wants to pipe in or, or not. I will, I will say, I don't think it, it should change. I think $500,000 is quite a lot of money going to a consultant to do the work that is prescribed here. Um, and yes, we wanna get a very competent consultant to do the work because we don't have to, we don't want to have to go back five years down the road to say, we botched it the first time, uh, let's do it again. So I, I think the 500,000 would be sufficient to look at the zero to five system primarily. And you wanna think about financing, you wanna think about how much it's gonna cost to, to pay the providers reasonable wages and, and compensation and so forth. Uh, you wanna think about the cost of, of the CCFAP program. Um, and then you wanna, come up with some financing mechanisms and analyze the effect of those financing mechanisms on the overall economy. So it is a substantial piece of work uh, that's going to take some money. There's always a question about whether you put the 500,000 in the legislation, which tells the bidders bid at 499,000, right? Or do you just put the bid out there with, with no dollar amount and see what you get, which is what we did in the higher education study. Um, we oh, got so we a can, huge range of bidders from so 150,000 to 900,000. So well, Joyce, you never know. I like, um, Joyce, I like your idea. We will take the money out and then our bill will, go, will, will be less when we go to appropriations. Right, so, right so that... <laughs> That's, that's someone else's decision, not my decision, but um, it is worth considering. Okay, thank you. I love that idea, Madam <laughs> Chair. <laughs> uh, of course, now we're on YouTube, so people can go and, yes. and, and, and look and whatever. Um, I'm, I'm nervous, um, Nolan, um, in that we only have, um, it's 9.52 um, in, in terms of moving to, um, the fiscal note, I don't know that we have enough time right now. What do you think? Um, I can do it quickly, but probably not in seven minutes. So maybe until we'll, you come back. Okay. Okay. Um, we also, um, we, we also have, uh, um, some, so a work in progress of suggestions from um, <clears throat> Let's Grow Kids who have been um, talking with uh, the treasurer um, because they um, have some concerns about what, about how we have um, written the finance, um, the, the, the language in the finance and how we took away um, some of the specifics. And if you recall, I began the conversation at one point with, um, okay, why did we, <clears throat> why did we um, make such a significant change in that section? And um, I'm, as I have said on numerous occasions, I'm the people person, not the money person. Um, so um, taking out money stuff is fine with me. Um, but I think there was a rationale. I mean, I do think there was a rationale. Um, Nolan. Um, the major rationale was that the old language was too prescriptive. Um, you know, uh, it's one thing to tell us what you want us to do, but when you start telling us how to do it, it starts making it more cumbersome and harder for the consultant to do their work. So I think that was a big part of it. That was the main part of it, you know. We were talking to Joyce earlier and, and um, mentioned how Joyce's previous job, not to throw on the spot, was she worked for the Congressional Budget Office. And Congress never would tell Congressional Budget Office how to do a study. So there was a, 
So there's uh, there were some limitations on on thinking in terms of like it's important to tell us what you want to get out of the study, but when you start saying who we have to speak to, who we need to include, who we need to consult with, um, it gets a little bit more cumbersome. So that was the rationale. Okay, um, and now I will give. Um... Uh, Sarah Kenny and Let's Grow Kids the opportunity to go, oh, Anne, you're misconstruing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the only thing that I think is misconstrued is the idea that we didn't support the work that the committee has already done because we definitely do. Um, I just wanna say that we this we bring this language forward in this truly the spirit of a friendly amendment. We actually really support the work that you all have done on this. I, I um, just, you just wanna make it better, I get it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Madam Chair, as you were saying, in when my colleague was talking to the treasurer last week, she was just talking about her experience of putting these kinds of studies out to bid and um, that it was helpful for her to have some guidance in terms of the specific roles for all the entities with whom the, the bill already says the consultant shall be consulting, just to give those folks an idea of sort of what their role might be in working with the consultant on this. Um, so that's, and it's truly, a, you know, we're not yeah. wedded to any of this language. We really do bring it in the spirit of trying to support sure. folks seeing with themselves, you know, seeing what their role might be in this. So. Um, not okay. at all went into it. And then the other component um, that I did want to highlight was in uh, conversations with the committee and folks at DCF around the questions about what does compensation commensurate with their peers mean and what are the components of a cost of care model. Um, we did some of the language that's in here um, specifically in subsection six um, that was trying to address that and provide a little bit more framing around some of the national organizations and the state the folks in the state who are thinking a lot about this and those conversations similar to the universal after school task force there are conversations happening that we would want the consultant to be you know tuned into they're not at the place of the, having a report handily this spring <laughs> to inform it but just wanting to provide some guidance and so there may be language that could be you know Okay. Just don't from all of this into a sentence or two, just referencing that work moving forward. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative McFawn, you have the last word in one minute. I can't hear you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I only have one question. Um, up until this point, I know we'll look at Let's grow kids, their information this afternoon, their suggestions, and we might look at something else. But up until this point, um, I want to thank all of those people from the administration and uh, Amy and all you people that have come into this process to help us. Um, my one question is this. Um, how do you feel about where we are now up until this point? Hello. Hello. Okay. Well, we well, we've heard from Sarah. I got, um, I heard from and I heard Let's Grow Kids say up until this point we're okay, but yep. we do have a suggestion. Right. And, and we'll look at that suggestion. <laughs> I'd like um, to know where the other people that are going to be really affected by this, <laughs> like the administration, yep. uh, like the after school. I, I want to know how you feel so far because we've done a lot of good work. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh. Um, Amy, uh, after school, I believe, is okay. And Sarah Truckel, um, for uh, the finance director, you now have a minute. <laughs> I guess I would say I think we've identified some areas where we still see uh, where we've pointed some issues in prior testimony. And if it's helpful for the committee, we're happy to have, you know, come back after your floor and, and go through those. But um, you know, we, we recognize the significant progress of the bill and the number of suggestions that you've included and are very appreciative of that as well. So, so we're moving closer. Would it be helpful for us to identify those, those couple um, I, areas? I think it would be um, helpful. Um, and and um, without any promise, just as without any promise to Let's Grow Kids that we will um, um, embrace all of the um, ideas, but we absolutely will consider them. Um, we are on the floor, um, folks, um, and then we have caucuses, and then we have lunch. Um, uh, so I, you know, and then we're back on the floor at one. 
Um, so I would say we will be back at committee um, at two, ready to work. So it, if you have any time, if any of you have any time between now and then to work on um, suggested language or to connect with relevant members of the committee or the administration um, to please do that between now and then. Um, and if it turns out that the floor is five minutes, we will do that. Okay, I've now gotten the third um, notice that we're supposed to be on the floor. So this ends the morning session.